Um, as most of you guys have known, Josh is, Josh is uh, works here at the uh, Utah Department of Transportation. He's done a lot with regards to uh, optimizing dollars for, for bridge preservation, which I think a lot of us um, have learned, for, learned from and are continuing to learn from. So please welcome Josh. So most of what I want to uh, introduce is, is the Bridge Preservation Guide. BYU is working on this, and uh, what, what we're trying to do is measure the effectiveness of bridge preservation. We've been now preserving bridges for at least 10 years and maybe as many as uh, 20, but there's not a lot of information nationwide on how effective it is. And so we're getting a lot of funding, we're seeing uh, a lot of momentum behind the idea of bridge preservation, but there's not a lot of data to support how effective it is and, and what are we doing that's more effective than, than something else. So I think as, as the idea of bridge preservation matures, we, as a community, we need to start understanding um, we've got all this momentum and money, how can we come and communicate what impact we're making? Um, especially in terms of extending service life, um, a lot of the things that Mike just, just brought out, I mean, I thought that was a great way of quantifying it, to say it should have lasted 50 years, it only lasted 40. That comes back to real dollars. That's, that's a really good way of looking at it. So in Utah, bridge preservation, um, a, lot of, a lot of some, or some of the things that we're doing begin in research. And what we're really cognizant of right now is taking that research and getting it into practice. So I've got this little flywheel that research is at the top and it comes all the way around to a bridge preservation guide. We expect the practitioner, our designers, and everybody within our community to be aware of what we're trying to do in terms of bridge preservation. So let me just begin with research. This started in 2004. I've got a uh, timeline you can see from 2004 to 2009. I was not at the department at this time. But this research was all happening. Uh, BYU did, did five out of the six projects I'm going to mention. In 2004, um, just some deck condition assessment guidelines. And what came out of that was um, condition assessment methods, maybe even more than visual, and began to recommend threshold values for things like chloride concentrations. And, and the idea was to determine preservation, rehabilitation, or replacement. So it was already trying to make this connection into decision making and effective decision making. 2005 then, the performance of concrete bridge deck surface treatments. So we we're right, already thinking about this in 2005. Uh, we probably just didn't have them in service long enough. So now we're coming back and, and looking at this again because now it's obviously 10 or 11 years later. But, what, but even back in 2005, we began to see that um, polymer concrete surface treatments can effectively resist concrete deterioration. I think something you've heard yesterday, you'll hear it again today, uh, the presentation that follows mine, I think we'll get into this a lot, uh, not Spencer's, but the next one, is uh, deck surface preparation. And we, we do know that these overlays will last 10 to 15 years if they're done properly. In 2006, then, we went into a condition analysis of concrete bridge decks. Some of the findings was that we need to supplement visual inspection. Visual inspection is not always going to lead us to a good, good decision. Inadequate concrete cover was a problem for us. And then just kind of an, an interesting point was that the decks with black bar were performing similarly to decks with epoxy coated rebar. This was 2006, I believe. So even at, at that point in time, where we were trying to relate causative factors to performance characteristics. So as we start to look at uh, the remaining service life, and, and you heard Carlos in the, in the keynote at the beginning talk about how we want to plan for every structure, we need to start looking at the specific parameters that are that, or even a, a group of parameters that we can attribute to one bridge uh, to help us estimate that remaining service life. 2006 then was our first attempt to create a uh, Utah Bridge Deck Index. 
There were just three parameters that went into that, age, cover, and half cell potential. I think we're more sophisticated than that today, but this is where it began. Um, and even sampling guidelines, acknowledging that visual inspection was not going to give us all the information we needed. We, uh, we began to look at deck service life and strategies to extend that service life. So back, you know, 10 years ago, we found that untreated and with no interventions, decks were lasting 35 years. Um, now the strategies, you know, a lot of the things that, that Mike brought up, um, maybe we can't get 75, but, you know, at least let's have a strategy for what we think might happen in the future. And if we need to get to 75 or 100, we have a strategy to do that. Then in 2008, we, we were looking at the timing. How quickly do chloride concentrations accumulate? You know, in Utah, we use an awful lot of salt. We have, we have ready access to it. And so how quickly do we need to apply that, that protection on the concrete? We found that when stay in place metal deck forms were used, the chloride concentrations got very high very quick. I think Spencer's gonna, gonna talk about that more in a minute. And then uh, we increased, so some impact on practice kind of things. We eliminated the stay in place metal deck forms, increased the cover to two and a half to the top mat, and then we decided to apply this, this initial overlay at the time of initial construction. There weren't a lot of agencies doing it at that time. I think, I think there's a few more now. And then just the, uh, the last study that we did in 2009 was we looked at uh, some more sophisticated types of materials. We looked at corrosion resistant rebar and, uh, and found that is also another effective strategy and we recommended to use it in both mats. There's, there's six projects then from 2004 to 2009. We have tried to build on that and I think, uh, I think you're, you'll see what we're gonna do there very soon with Spencer. Um, of course, we want to have an impact on practice. It's the idea behind the research. Some of the successful practices that we have and um, you know, this is, we've refined our practices over the years, but we do like the performance of polymer overlays. We're gonna, we're gonna measure their effectiveness. Now they've been in place up to 15 years, we should have enough data to really measure and see how effective they're, being, they're uh, performing. Whenever we can, we try to eliminate joints and utilize jointless bridge uh, design details, even in design for new construction provide additional cover. Those are a few of the successful practices that we've had and, um, and we've also learned some lessons. That middle one, time constraints. You know, we, we may have a really good treatment, but if you don't have enough time to apply it, it's not a good treatment. And so a lot of the, a lot of the work that we're looking at doing has to be compatible with the time constraints that we have on the facility. We're also looking at better deck assessment. Oftentimes, the, the element that we're looking at can't be visually inspected that well, and so we're, we're trying to supplement that with some NDT and NDE. If you were here for Carmen's presentation yesterday, you saw that it was important for us to integrate our entire practice. And so everything kind of begins with an in-service bridge in, in how we're going to plan uh, the work to replace it or to rehabilitate it. And the findings that are coming out of our inspection, how do we get those into design and, and uh, communicated across the board to everybody within our community? It was important that we had connectivity between all the different functions within Bridge. And so uh, three or four years ago, we, we made sure that that was the case. At the same time, uh, we continue to try to improve our data collection. We can characterize deterioration better as we, as we do this. and so. Like most states, uh, we've gone to entirely element level uh, bridge inspection practice. And then taking that data and combining it with economic analysis. One of the things that we also do is uh, leverage longer lasting materials. It's not feasible for us in most cases to return to the same bridge year after year to maintain it. So what we try to do is, is look for treatments that will give us at least 10 years of uh, maintenance-free operation. 
collecting all of our changes in practice and documenting them to, to convey consistently across our community was important as well. And so um, it hasn't always, you know, a lot of our good ideas sometimes kind of die when that person leaves or they change jobs or, you know, some major change happens. So it's also, it was also important for us to collect all of the good practices that we had, document them and communicate them, keep this up to date uh, so that we're always moving forward as a community. And then, of course, measuring performance. This, this goes into a lot of what we're talking about with, in terms of effectiveness. If we can't measure our performance, we don't know how effective we are, it's going to be hard down the road to continue to ask for funds and make funding asks uh, without this kind of information. So that was kind of a look back. And now we'll, um, we'll move into the reason we wanted a Utah Bridge Preservation Guide. Uh, three major objectives, estimate remaining service life, use all the tools and strategies that we have uh, to come up with a, a solid answer to what is the remaining service life on each bridge. We also wanted to assess the existing treatments. We feel like there's enough, they've been in service now long enough that we can do this. And then take that information and develop a decision making tool that identifies specific triggers for specific treatments. So I'm going to turn the time now over to Dr. Guthrie with BYU, and uh, he's going to talk about what we're doing with this, with this current project. It's currently underway, and it's uh, scheduled for completion next year. So I'm not going to take questions now, but if you have questions, save them up after Dr. Guthrie is done. If you have a question for either one of us, we'll take it at that time.